Hi, I'm Joe Heath. I'm Tony Heath. And this is the Watchathon of Rassilon. Yay! Today, we are going to be talking about the docudrama, An Adventure in Space and Time, which Why aired... Why do you keep calling it a docudrama? Because it's a docudrama. Is it? Yeah. It's a dr- dramatized docu... Like, it's a, it's a based on a real thing. Well, whatever. A docudrama it aired... was like a drama it's a... filmed in the form of a documentary. No. Oh, that's like a mockumentary, maybe. No, a docudrama is like dramatized things of actual events. Oh, that was just historical fiction. This isn't historical fiction. This isn't a, I mean, it's a period piece, but like not like period, period piece. Anyway, it <laughs> aired on November 21st, 2013 for as part of the 50th anniversary of Doctor Who. Which we have not stuff. actually gotten to yet, so don't talk to us about it. <laughs> yeah, we're like halfway through series seven. We are Currently. taking this year off to get caught up on New Who uh, mm. while continuing to watch Classic Who. This is, this is a special uh, episode. Uh, it's just the two of us today, no guests. But uh, we're, we're going to talk about Adventure in Space and Time, which hey. is the, the film about uh, the making of Doctor Who, uh, specifically the first Doctor's era. Yeah. And this is basically a look back... At uh, all of that time, at what we've watched so far, the first Doctor era. Yeah, so we're going to talk about that, and then we're going to talk about, yeah, the first Doctor and our, our experiences and, and stuff. And then later we'll have some fun games. We have some stuff planned. We have, yeah, we have things planned. Uh, now this beginning bit, we don't have planned at all! Huh? At all! How did you even do that to your voice? I, I just uh, channeled Ben Jackson. Is your throat hurt? Ah! <laughs> I'm Ben. That's dead on. They should have cast me in this video, in this film. The film that we're reviewing right now, they should the cast film you in that. We're reviewing right now. Let's talk about it. So okay. it's about uh, the first Doctor, uh, William Hartnell. I mean, it's about the starting of Doctor Who in general. It starts with this really nice intro. I wanted to get that on record. Uh, there's like this. 50s or 60s black and white bbc logo and it's like warning you about like like one of those like the following program or whatever thing but it's about it's about doctor who and stuff and it was really nice i really like that i thought that was a nice little i have zero idea what you're talking about the intro to the movie it's like shows the bbc logo it's black and white it's got the globe and it's got the announcer over it what's it say i don't remember you really like it and you don't remember what it said i don't remember what it said word for word but it's like you know, the following program is blah, blah, blah. And then it oh. ends with, and then I think it says something about time and space. Or space and time. Yeah. Okay, I, see, I, I know what you're talking about now. And then it cuts to the opening credits, which is the... <laughs> thing. The... The... <laughs> the thing. The, the, it's a... The feedback. The, the vortex. Feedback. Yeah. And it has, like, an amazing piece of score under it. The dude who did the music you for looked, this... You looked up his name, didn't you? Because we both really like the score. Yeah, it was like, um, Freddy Asshole. No. I don't think so. I do think his last name was Butts. Yeah, Freddy Asshole. Um, <laughs> this is a real person who made music that we both enjoyed. Edmund Butt. So stop calling him Asshole. <laughs> uh, Edmund Butt. But it's spelled B-U-T-T as yes. well. Edmund Butt. You're 12 years old. His name is really Edmund Butt! We really enjoyed the score that he made with his mind. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it was really good. It was really... I don't know, I liked it a lot. Especially the, like, title credits yeah. music. That was really it was excellent. Good. And, uh, and, oh, it starts with, like, the end of Hartnell. Yeah, and there's a cool, like, little, like... What are those, what are those kinds of clocks called? The, like, rotating... When it would like when it went back to pass for the oh first it was like time. it was on the TARDIS console it was the yearometer thing the yearometer and it like spun back to the the first year of Doctor Who it was really cool I liked that shot a lot yeah 
And do you know how we know it was the end of Hartnell? Because we just watched the last serial. Yes. And, uh... We're like, this... This is familiar. Also, that line is slightly wrong. I did that a couple of times. <laughs> yeah, they did change a lot. Um, they but yeah, were... it's, uh, this is the Cyberman from the Tenth Planet walks into shot. Uh, yeah, and then starts smoking a cigarette. <laughs> you like that shot a lot. No, but there's a couple of times where they show like I mean them filming parts of the show, and uh, I would be like, that's that's slightly wrong. I know because I just watched it. <laughs> they do the radiation gloves drugs line, but. There was no Daleks there, but in the actual episode, I think he's just saying it to like Ian and Barbara and yeah. Susan because they all react as if he'd said drugs. But in the the TV movie, he's like uh, held up by like Daleks and stuff, and he says like we won't get your radiation drugs or gloves. I mean drugs. Yeah. I just messed up the mess up. <laughs> and I they do incorporate a lot of his sort of bloopers, like he did say fornicator. Although I heard that it wasn't like a. I heard that he yeah. said it to, like, mess with people, to make specifically uh, Carol and Ford laugh. In the... in the, oh the gosh. What? Just the relationship between the Doctor and Susan and the actors who play them was so cute. I'm just going to say they also included, like, the Chesterton, Chetterton yeah. thing, uh, which is also in the script. But, like, in the... I feel like in the this docu... this docudrama... They sort of, I mean, he did have problems remembering his lines and stuff and would screw them up. That is legit, but some of it is also scripted. But I feel like they just sort of, to tell the story a little bit better, because they have to condense so much right. into like an hour and a half of things. So they kind of move things around a bit. Which I think yeah. they did an excellent job of telling the story concisely and emotionally. Because even when it was like, oh, wait, that's not right. We were still like, eh, it's all right. Right. Every, I mean, you could see that anything that... Everything was there for a purpose. I like what you said about it uh, when it was over. Cho turned to me and he said, that was the best episode of Doctor Who that Mark Caddis has ever written. That's true. Which is true. Maybe he should write classic Who instead of new Who. Or just write about Doctor Who instead of for Doctor Who. Uh, the, the, we, we have the DVD Blu-ray combo and it has a bonus DVD, which is the, the first serial, Unearthly Child. And it has sketches which are done by Mark Gaddis, and they're better than his Doctor Who episodes. <laughs> and they're all about it's Doctor so Who. Neat. They're about Doctor Who. Well, that's what I'm saying, yeah. <laughs> Clearly, that's where he needs to be. Another thing that I noticed they changed, because they filmed the pilot, and then they have to refilm the pilot. When they show the pilot the second time, it ends with a cliffhanger, which was actually the end of the serial's cliffhanger, and not the end of that episode. That episode. They actually do show the end of that episode cliffhanger as well. Because they're like, the whole caveman thing and where like the, the shadow comes up. They talk about that. But then they show the, the, the cliffhanger when they redo the pilot. And it's like, that's the fourth episode. Right. That's a little, little odd, but still. They like recreated that cliffhanger like dead on though. Yeah, they recreated a whole bunch of, of scenes. Oh man, just Hartnell like not really being into it so much. When the, okay, when the movie opens, it's Hartnell and and his granddaughter, and he's kind of all grumpy. <laughs> he's kind of rude to his granddaughter, and it made me mad. Her sandpa was her sandpa, <laughs> which apparently, like uh, I read, like that's that's really what she used to call him because she couldn't say grandpa. Really? Mm-hmm. Oh, it was cute. Um, but no, and like he's he's not really. I don't think like super sold on the role. Until he realizes, like, what a big deal it is to, like, the kids. Mm -hmm. And, like, there's the scene where he they, they show, you know, the, the blooper of him saying gloves on air. And his granddaughter's like, you knew that you needed gloves because the Daleks are nasty. And he's like, yes. Yep. <laughs> yes. And, like, there's the scene where he's at the park. And, like, there's, like, this one little kid who's like, you're the doctor. Can I have your autograph? Can I have your autograph? And then all of a sudden there are like 20 little kids and they're all following him around the park and he's like leading them around the park and pretending to be the doctor and like taking them on an adventure. <laughs> so cute. That was probably like the first time of like 80 that I cried. <laughs> yeah, like he was like really concerned about the children and stuff. Because, like, The he's, buttons thing? Yeah, he's like, I gotta know, I need to see the set. Because they're like, they've already started filming, but they haven't got the set done for the interior of the TARDIS. And he's like, I need to see it. I need to know what I'm doing. And they're like, it doesn't really matter. You just press a button and it's fine. He's like, no, kids are watching. 
they'll know. And if it's not real, it's you know, it's gonna it's gonna take them out of it. Like they they need it to be real. Yeah, kids are smart. They'll they'll if know. I, if I press the button to open the door one week, and then press a different button to open the door next week, and apparently that's, that's why so many of the like buttons and levers have just like Sharpie labels <laughs> written right next to them. That's why. Yeah, I think that's absolutely adorable. Actually, uh, uh, most everyone in this movie is cute. But Bes- even besides Hartnell, played by uh, David Bradley, by the way, which most people probably know as Filch from the Harry Potter films. He did a good William Hartnell. He did. He did like the eyes really well. <laughs> He's also in New Who. He was in Dinosaurs on a Spaceship. He was the the villain of that piece. I don't know if he did that first. Yeah, he would have had to have done that first. He would have had to have done Dinosaurs on a Spaceship first because this was before the fiftieth. Yeah, yeah. So other adorable people. Uh, include uh, Sidney Newman, played by Brian Cox, who people may remember from X-Men 2, who has a, a catchphrase, just pop, pop, pop. And, uh, <laughs> yes, he does say that a lot. And he's sort of like the guy who created, not, I mean, sort of came up with the idea. He's like, we just need a sci-fi show. I also think they like combined him with like David Whitaker. I, feel, I think I read that somewhere. Who was mm-hmm. another influential person that they just kind of had to... That's a bummer. Yeah. <laughs> That's a bummer if that's you. Oh, he also, in his introduction to the movie, he, like, pulls up to a spot and, like, gets in, like, a argument with, like, the guard at the the BBC place. And uh, the guard's like, I need to see your ID. And he's like, I'm Sidney Newman. I, like, run this joint. And then then the the guard's like, no, I need to see your ID and blah, blah, blah. It's Ian. It's, yeah. It's Ian. It's Ian Chesterton. There's a lot of of cameos. Yeah. William Russell plays that guard and he's like... I didn't recognize any of the cameos. I don't know what's wrong with me because I rewatched that scene. I was like, yeah, that's clearly Ian. I don't know how I missed that. Carol Ann Ford, uh, who played Susan in the movie, once sort of Doctor Who starts picking up and taking off the, like, there's a scene where, like, there's a woman in the street, like, saying, kids, come in, that show you want to watch is coming on, and that's Susan. I think Vicky and Polly, I think it's Vicky and Polly. The actresses who played them are at Verity Lambert's going away party when she eventually leaves the show. No, it was Polly. Uh, it was Polly and it wasn't Vicky. It was uh, Polly and uh, Sarah Kingdom. Yeah, they had a couple of cameos, but I was gonna say and the dude who played Marco Polo. I think besides like guys, we cried so much. This. Joe went into it knowing that he was going to cry a lot, and I was like, I'll probably I'll go cry. It'll be fine. I cried. I think I cried more than you did. I cried a lot. So, if you guys are patrons you, at our, I feel like, like I looked over and you weren't crying. I was holding it back. That's what I was doing. <laughs> if you're a patron at our watch along level, you've got so much blackmail footage of just us openly weeping. You know, I, I talked a little bit about the emotions of watching Hartnell just interact with kids and seeing how important that was to him. But like another aspect that I really liked, which is, you know, really important in the movie and it just makes you feel good watching it. Is watching Verity and Warris get this thing, <laughs> and <Going>. they <laughs> yeah they have this scene where it's like because Verity is the producer yes and Warris is uh, the director, director of the first serial and they I, they, they kind of made it seem like he directed a whole lot more than he I think he actually did oh but really like, yeah I mean that's another one of those instances where they have to sort of combine things but yeah but you do you they have this scene where they're they're meeting for the first time and they're talking about how they're really sort of outsiders when it comes to, you know, this whole making TV thing. Um, Because Verity's a woman and he's Indian? And I think they were hinting that he was gay. I'm not sure. (laughs) I feel like that's what that scene was about, right? Like, where the dude was, like, checking him out at the bar? It did seem that way, yeah. Is he? I mean, he's, like, alive. He's an alive, real person. You can Google (laughs) it. That's true. You know when you watch, like, Classic Who and there's ridiculous stuff, there's mics... You know, in in the shot, and there's people running into cameras, and it's like a, it's another thing to kind of watch them be like, "Well, we only get to we only get to you know reshoot something three times. That's it." So, and just watching things like slowly go wrong, and trying to fix them, and just trying to keep things together when you really don't have like the resources to do what you're doing, and then doing it anyway, which is something like I've been on like live productions before. And I've been there where it's like, everything is going wrong, but it's fine, we're going to make a show. <laughs> because we're live in, you know, a minute, so... Actually, a minute's like forever. <laughs> That's plenty of time to fix a problem. Yeah, he was gay. 
Yeah, all right, there you go. That was totally intended. <laughs> but just watching them and, like, seeing them of, like, they shoot the pilot and they're told, we don't like this, shoot it again. After they've, like, struggled to just get to where they are right. already. Like, I, I want to mention, like, my favorite joke, which is, like, Verity is, like, you know, doing whatever and, like, Warris storms in. And this is, like, the first scene with Warris. And he's like, uh, what is happening? I am being thrown in the deep end here. Everything's awful and blah, blah, blah. There's there's all this weird stuff in the script we don't have the budget for. And then Verity's just like, well, we're going to have to do it. But uh, he's like, she's like, he's like, all right, well, where are we filming it? And she's like, it's this studio. He's like, are you kidding me? It's smaller on the inside. <laughs> that is an excellent joke. But yeah, I mean, and then once they start doing well, they still get told by like execs, like, we want you to shut this down, kill this show, basically. Uh, there's a scene where I think some higher-ups tell Sydney that. There he comes in and is like, no, <laughs> you're yeah. not going to. We have something here, and you're, not, and you're, you know, you're going to give it a chance. And I just can't oh, even... Oh, the reason they were going to kill it wasn't after... I don't think it was after... It started doing well. It was that the first episode aired, but it was the same... It was like the day after or the same day as the Kennedy assassination and then she's like no play it again play it again and then what like really got to me is i can't even imagine that like feeling and sense of satisfaction of just being the most right (laughs) (laughs) when you're watching the thing on air 50 years later i can't imagine 50 plus now right that's what i'm saying i can't i can't imagine you know being some of the people that helped you know create this thing and had to fight for it and then getting to watch the 50th special being like, told ya. <laughs> yeah. No one will ever be as right as I'm as right right now. <laughs> like, like, there was so many times they could have just ended it because, you know, it wasn't doing well or things went wrong. Like they, like I said, they had to refill the pilot because, like, the doors of the TARDIS kept opening. <laughs> kept opening and there's two people just scrambling to close them again. Yeah, and that, I mean, that's not just, uh, like, a drama, that's not just, like, amping up the drama of, for a movie that really happened, you can see that on the on the uh, DVD. The other thing I kept had thinking the, the original pilot as well is if could you imagine if you had like the ability to travel through alternate to like parallel universes? There's a parallel universe where someone went, no, but look, it's not going to happen. It didn't get the ratings we wanted, and just like traveling back and like playing this movie and be like, you're so dumb. <laughs> You screwed up so bad. You have no idea how bad you screwed up. What did you think of, like, uh, how well the characters matched? Like, the Doctor to the Doctor and the Companions. I will tell you, Hartnell was pretty good. Uh, Susan was eerily good. Mm. Like, spot on. Like, it creeped me out a little bit. (laughs) But she was really, really good. Um, She looked, like, dead on. Yeah, she really did. Uh, Ian... He wasn't very good. He wasn't. Barbara was okay. Barbara had the hair, man. No, no, no. Well, I mean, yeah, but the woman at the party at the beginning of the se- the, the the movie had looked more like Barbara <laughs> than the person that got playing Barbara. I thought it was Barbara. I don't think it was Barbara. It was just one of Verity's friends. Wait, that wasn't the same person? I don't think so. No. I have face bondless. I just assumed that it was. <laughs> Talk about, like, Susan and the... And the doctor, they they had like a really nice scene together. So yeah, like definitely William Hartnell, apparently uh, in real life and in this movie as well, is kind of grumpy. He is kind of a grumpy old man. There was this one particular scene where he just, I don't remember, you know, what was happening, but he just was kind of short with mm. some of the other... She's the The actress playing Susan, Carol Ann Ford, was like spending her money on stuff. And he oh. was like, you gotta... Keep a better better track of that and blah, blah, blah. She's like, I'll do what I want. Thank you very much. I'm not a, I'm not a child. And, uh... Being her character. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> being very in character, it seemed like, for both of them. And he sent her flowers to apologize. And I think there was some interview at the end with Ian. Do you remember that? With with William Russell? Where he was saying that, like, yeah, stuff like that used to happen. Where he would, like, get kind of cross. And mm-hmm. he sent flowers to all the girls... And he was saying what the guys got. Cookies, I think. Biscuit, yeah. Biscuits, Biscuits. yeah. <laughs> it wasn't William Russell. It was uh, the guy who played Mar- Marco Polo. Oh, was know. it? Mm-hmm. I think so. Oh, yeah. you, I think you're right. He was the guy that was like, you need to kill Doctor Who, by the way. That was his character. Really? Yeah. I, I think it's really interesting that this movie starts out basically being Verity and Warris' movie. 
Yeah. Like, they are sort of the center, and Hartnell's just sort of, like, secondary character. He's but almost then... like an obstacle of, like, <sighs> trying to convince him to do it, and then he'll, you know, get mad at things, and it's the two of them going, no, it'll be, it'll be fine, just don't worry, <laughs> please yeah. stay. As the movie goes on, he gets attached to the show, and then the movie slowly drifts away from... Not, like, in a bad way, but it, like, switches from being Verity and Morris's movie to Hartnell's movie, yeah. like, for the second half. And it, is an, it was a nice swap. Yeah, well, because you absolutely, you start with, like, your under, you know, your underdog story. And it's like, we're going to take this, we're going to make something great. And then they do. And, and then, then they, yeah, they, yeah, one by one, people slowly start leaving. And then, like, really, really, that's what happened. Hartnell was, like, they had a new creative team. They replaced um, all the companions. And Hartnell's, like, mm-hmm. the only person who was still there. And there's, like, a couple of scenes where, you know, they're trying to make the brow- the time router. Is that what it's called? Well, the, the council thing. The middle thing that goes up and Rotor? down. Rotor. I don't know. Sure. I don't remember. That thing. They're trying to figure out how to turn it on. William Hartnell's like, does this button down here? I'll do it. I have to do everything myself. Because he's, like, you know, he's the only one who's been there. He's the only one who, he, he, and he, you really get that, like, sense in the movie that he's, like, I'm the only one right now at this point who, like, gets, like, I'm, is, yeah. I'm in charge of making sure that it, you know, stays Doctor Who. And it's, like, really sad because, like, you've, you've got, like, Susan leaves first and then William Hartnell's like, well, at least I've got you, Verity. And then Verity's like, I'm leaving. <sighs> and this is after... Hartnell's wife is talking to Verity saying, hey, listen, you need to lay off of him a bit. Like, give him easier stuff, more time off. He's not doing well. He won't say that. Right. But, because his, his health is, like, failing and his, and he's going, like, full tilt in this show, basically. And it's more than he can really handle, but he won't say that because he, well, apparently, he loves it, the show. Was it the three doctors? Oh, yeah, the was three doctors. That, we haven't watched yet. But. <clears throat> we haven't watched yet, but apparently, yeah, he was contacted. Troughton. Troughton. Troughton contacted him and was like, hey, you want to be in this? And he was like, yes, absolutely. I'll do whatever. I'm totally, I'm totally in. And his wife had to like go back behind him and be like, he can't do as much as he thinks he can do. <laughs> he is really stubborn and he'll try. Don't let him. <laughs> <laughs> they just set up cue cards for him to read. And uh, I think it, it looks like it was just like a pre-filmed yeah. thing. I don't know. I love. I love that he was so stubborn. That he's just like, yeah, I can do it. Totally can do it. Like he. And he's like, I can't let down the kids. Like they need. <sighs> they need Doctor Who. And he's just like all alone, basically. Sydney's. They. They come out up with the idea of recasting the regeneration. They say regeneration in the thing, but like it doesn't get called regeneration until like way later. But yeah. Anyway, but... And like Sydney has to like tell. Like break the news break to the him. News. And it's. Oh, it's just they heartbreaking. They take something. They take. A specific line that annoyed me when it happened in Doctor Who and made me bawl like a baby. That's coming up, though. I want to I <sighs> first say, like, they're like, we know you've been having troubles and we need to to take care of this. And he's like, yeah, yeah, give me less lines. I'll improvise and blah, blah, blah. And they're like, no, we want to recast. And he just like, it's like, yeah, all right. Uh, that sounds good. Uh, who did you have in mind? And they're like, this guy and he's like yeah Troughton yeah no one else but him could do it and blah 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 and just like very like yeah and then he goes home and he's talking to his wife about it and he's like this will open up open up new opportunities for me it'll be good it'll be good oh my god and then then I'm gonna cry right now yeah then he's just his wife sort of leaves to go get something or or whatever and he just start leans against the fireplace and just starts crying and is like I don't want to go. Ah! <laughs> I'm crying. I am. It's happening. And then she like comforts him and stuff, but he just he would have been the doctor forever. If he could yeah, if he could have been. <sighs> he was so good at it. I'm so proud of Doctor Who for existing, you guys. <laughs> I'm so proud of everyone who's in it and made it a thing. And I'm so proud of everyone who watches it and loves it. And then you're <laughs> emotional right now. It was a good movie. Over just all in all. Oh, and then of course we go back to the end and he films his last scene. Uh the guy that got playing Troughton does not look like Troughton very much, but did a really good impression nonetheless. Also I wanna run through. The other companions were pretty good, though you don't really see much of them. 
but they put, like Ben and Polly, they just do it's just like one shot of them basically. Yeah. And uh, I was like, I immediately don't like this guy. So <laughs> good didn't job. Even like the character playing the actor who plays Ben. I didn't. <laughs> But everybody else looked pretty good too, um, even though they were mostly just for like a montage of like of this like is... people are leaving, things are changing. Yeah. But uh, he, he 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 goes to film his last scene. Were you going to talk about it? Yeah. Why? Why not? I had actually knew known this was going to happen. I did not. I did. Ben actually says it in the last podcast. I don't know who he's talking about. Because <laughs> like, if you've watched the Tenth Planet when he's regenerating, the TARDIS is sort of moving on its own. Levers are going up and down by themselves. And clearly you have, because we just we just did that one. That was our yeah. last episode. <laughs> so they're filming the scene, and, like, Hartnell looks over uh, to the left, where those, like, knobs and dials that go up and down are, and there's Matt Smith there. And they just sort of share a look, and, like, Matt Smith toggles the things. He's just gonna keep it going. I have to say, for someone who, like, gets mad if a show or a movie isn't set far enough in the future because it upsets your, like, your suspension of disbelief, that didn't seem to bother you at all. No, because it's like, it works emotionally. (laughs) It's exactly 50 years in the future, Tony. Okay. (laughs) I don't understand you at all. And also, this is just, like, a poetic thing. It's not, like, a real thing. So are anything else (laughs) where we've had this this argument this is completely different in what way what what i have a problem with is stuff that's set in the future that's already passed right what or I'm it's going is, to come to pass this is like a moment where you're like this is hard no and he's looking to like the future the, the current doctor who and how it's still going now but now it's 11 and we're on 12 and it dates it not necessarily it just means this show's still going 50 years in the future. It's not a link from then to now. It's a link from then to like 50 years from to now. To specifically exactly 50 years in the future. Yeah, because it's a 50-year special. <laughs> the, there was jokes that they were going to refilm with Capaldi. They're going to refilm with every doctor. They didn't do that. I think they should. But I... no, I liked it. It made me cry. And also, I didn't care because I haven't gotten to Capaldi yet. Do you so think, it works would emotionally Would you feel for me. differently if we were on Capaldi? I might. Probably not, because I love Matt Smith, and his face is an adorable baby face. There's nothing I can argue with there. And, Matt um, Smith has a good face. Congrats on your face. And then the movie, and then you're crying at that, which is kind of, I want to admit, it's really cheesy, but I, I still cry. You still cry, yeah. And then we get the wrap-ups of what happened to everyone, and then they play the speech from the Dalek Invasion of Earth. Where the doc- doctor is saying goodbye to Susan and the whole, like, that speech. And I'm just like, no, I can't cry anymore. We're done. But I We're do. out of tears. I just keep crying. Before we go into final thoughts, I do want to mention a couple jokes that we kind of skipped over just because I want to mention them because I like them. All right, go for it. Uh, when they're filming the, the cliffhanger for an unearthly child, which is the caveman shadow coming up, they're wanting to black out the guy's teeth, the caveman's teeth. <laughs> And he will not do it. The, the director's like, just, just, we just need to black out his teeth. It's just gonna, it's even just gonna be his shadow. It doesn't really matter. And he's like, he's like, he said he got his teeth whitened to get on television. And I really like that line. When they're, when Sydney and Morris are talking to Hartnell about the show, trying to convince him to be on the show, they're like, this is what it is. This is what it's about. And you're the doctor. And then he goes, Doctor Who. <laughs> They did so many of those sort of, like, winks, and I loved every single one of them. (laughs) They're really dumb and cheesy, but, uh, uh, like, or the scene where, like, Sydney is like, no bug-eyed monsters, no robots, no mutations, no brains and glass jars. And then, (laughs) like, literally every single one of those happens, (laughs) like, within the first season of Doctor (laughs) Who. It's a really good film. That's, it. I kind of am curious how people would feel about it if they've not really seen any of this. But being someone who has watched all of it, I feel like it's particularly emotional. Seeing how far it's come and where it started, seeing behind the scenes of all the stuff we just watched. We literally just watched the entire first Doctor and, and seeing how all of that came together and and how it all kind of ended is magical and like how it still continues to this very day is it's beautiful and like this movie it's maybe a little cheesy in places but like it's good cheese it's good cheese 
the cast is all really good. Even I think even if you're not into like the classic Who, if you just like New Who, just see where it's all started. I don't know how you couldn't cry at this movie. <laughs> It's all it's all just very, very good. I I have no no problems with it. No. Not one. And that's surprising coming from You. Well me or or being a uh Mark Gaddis script. Jeez. Uh, no, I like Mark Gaddis. I feel like Lay he gets a lot of hate. Guy. <laughs> His episodes aren't the best. They're not terrible, but they're not like top tier level maybe. I mean, I'm not but, arguing with you. Like his last one he wrote that I saw. I thought it was okay. I, I liked it. I liked it more than watched. most people did, I feel like. The Dollhouse one, mm-hmm. I thought it was okay. I, I thought the TV one was okay. Mm. I think maybe he's better at maybe character emotional stuff than he is actual plot stuff, maybe. Anyway, that's not about this. This was just really good, and I can't recommend it enough. Go see it. I think it is a perfect celebration of everything that Doctor Who is. On its own, knowing nothing about Doctor Who, that's a good movie. It's a well-written, well-produced movie. It's fantastic. <laughs> I feel like you could know nothing about Doctor Who and watch this movie and be like, that was good. I don't think you'd get like the emotional, sobbing, happy, crying, heartfelt response that we got, but I think you could watch that and be like, yeah, that was a good movie. But yeah, just watching it makes you so proud. <laughs> I don't think I've ever had, like, the emotional reaction to, like, a franchise (laughs) that I had watching this movie of just, like, not only am I just, like, so proud that they were able to, like, make this a thing and I'm just thrilled that it's still going and, like, you know, that feeling of, like, you know, we've created something that's that's important and that means something to a lot of people but then also like you know seeing those kids running around and dressed up as Daleks and playing Doctor Who and thinking about my cousins (laughs) who every single one of my cousins all watch Doctor Who my, my younger cousins every single one of them and like I don't know, I want to say two, three years ago, everyone was over at my house, my parents' house, for Christmas, and they were playing Doctor Who, and actually, my cousins were fighting because one of my boy cousins told one of my girl cousins that she couldn't be the doctor, Ah. (laughs) because the doctor has to be a boy, and she was like, that's stupid. I'm going to be the doctor. But just the idea of, like, kids have been doing that for years. For 50 years. <laughs> That's amazing. For, and, and, like, and to start at such, like, everything was against it. When Sydney's pitching it, they're like, science fiction. Huh. The shittiest studio. The, the pilot fails abysmally. The JFK thing happens. Just everything that's going against it. It almost got killed multiple times. Even like when they're like, do we just end the show? It's doing really well, but Hartnell's not. We can't continue a show without the Doctor. So many points where it could have failed or just ended and it's still going. And just how much it means to everyone involved. You know, like, everyone who gets a chance to act on the show, they talk about it like, I watched it growing up, I loved it, now I'm, you know, a part of it. And the people, just to, like, the people who just watch it, to the people who are just us. (laughs) It means so much to everyone. I don't know, it just makes your heart feel all warm and full, and your eyes all watery. (laughs) It's great. Watch it. (laughs) Yeah, watch it. (laughs) So since this is kind of our our last thing before moving on to two, I figured we'd take this episode as our look back. First Doctor Wrap Up! Okay. <laughs> we could call it that. But yeah, our look back at the William Hartnell era. We're going to play a Sweet 16 of... I don't know why you're laughing. We're going... I've never heard that phrase before in my life. That's because it's a sports thing. <laughs> a sweet 16 of of one serials. And real quick, before we do that... We're going to rank... We're going to rank companions? Companions. All right. Now, I'm just going by what Wikipedia counts as a companion. One of these companions... I feel iffy about, which is Sarah, Sarah Kingdom, because she exists solely in one serial, and if you're going to count that, you might as well include Brett, who's not included. I think, I feel like a lot so of people use Companion as anyone who traveled in the TARDIS, no matter how shortly. Like, you, you took a trip in the TARDIS, you're a Companion. But isn't, like, the third Doctor landlocked? That's a really good point. Yeah, I don't know. Is. I would not have added Sarah Kingdom to the list. But we're including her because we're going by Wikipedia I feel like ours is the exact same except for the first one. Yeah. All right. Coming in last. <laughs> and no surprise to anyone who has listened to this podcast for any amount of time. Benjamin Jackson. We don't like him. We don't like Ben. I try to, by the way. I try really hard to like every companion. <laughs> 
I mean, you just know that, like, I don't know. There are so many different types of people out there. I like that there's, like, somebody out there for everyone. Every character, there's somebody who's like, that's my favorite. And I always want to be, like, try and see what that person sees. I don't like Ben. There's only been, like, a handful of moments, Ben, like, that I, uh, I've enjoyed of Ben, which is mostly him getting thrown off of a <laughs> so railing. Mean. That being said, I will Do fight th- people who don't like Dodo. Do you think he'll be at the bottom of the of the list for the second companions? I don't know. Second Doctor companions? Maybe mm. not, because maybe he'll either develop or we'll get somebody we hate worse. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've said enough about Ben. Sorry. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Coming in at number ten, Ben. <laughs> All right, time for number nine, Katarina, who doesn't have a last name. I'm not, like, I'm not disputing with you at all. She She, didn't have enough time to do anything. Yeah, she didn't get a fair shake, Katarina. Because I liked her. They didn't know what to do with her character. And then, so they killed her. So they just killed her. That's unfair to her. I feel like there's things that could have been done with her, but they just didn't do it. Also, she was fairly clever, I feel like, for somebody. Okay. I do. (laughs) I don't know what evidence there is of that. She chucked herself into space. Well, (laughs) For not knowing anything that's happening, she kind of picks up on things relatively quickly. That's what I think the problem with her character is, is that they're just like, oh, we need her to do this. I don't know, I feel like if they played up her sort of... Cleverness? Not not necessarily her cleverness, but her sort of fish out of waterness a bit for like comedic purposes, I feel like she could have lasted oh, a bit longer. No, I would have hated that. No, I mean I'm like... I'm just being like, what's this? What's that? I, I don't know things. That would be annoying. No, it wouldn't. It'd yes, be it would. Anya from Buffy, and that's amazing. Okay. It would be Tilk from Stargate. Oh, if she could be Anya. Yes. Exactly. Just not understanding what's going on, really, but in a funny way. Not just like, what's this? I don't know. That's dumb. But, like, to play it for, like, comedy, to be, like... In these like situations, like eh. like it was hilarious in say the Daleks' master plan, the the comedy episode where they they wind up on the movie set and they don't know what a movie is because they're so far from the future or whatever. And they're just like, I don't know what the fuck that was. <laughs> Okay. That was awful. That's fair. That's totally fair. Do that with Katarina. And you got something. Right. She comes going. in ninth, but it's not her fault. We love her. She just didn't get anything to do. Uh, which brings us to number eight. Number eight is Polly, which she doesn't actually have a last name. I think they just, in extended stuff, made her Called right. Called right. Polly Wright. Which I do not care for. Do not care that they gave her the same last name as Barbara. <laughs> but Polly Wright. Uh, I mean, it happens. There are plenty of Heaths. That's true. But, like, so close to... I don't know. She had the same problem of Katarina, which is that she just doesn't have a lot. She's to someone who I could see like bumping up a whole bunch of spaces in like a two, just because. Yeah, she's not so low because we don't like her. She's so she's not done much. Yeah, she's she just is. kind of been around, and she's probably a little low because she is kind of attached to Ben. We do not like. We do not <laughs> like. Why does she rank above Katarina? Just because there's more of her? <sighs> that's a good question, actually. She's not and as now... badly written as Katarina. Yeah, I think that's it. Katarina was kind of unevenly written. I guess with like Polly, too, those... is like the idea that like I know they failed with Katarina's character. They like didn't know what they were doing with her, and they just sort of were like, nah. Yeah. Uh, Polly, like, there's still hope for her. <laughs> and I'm not willing to just like shove her at the bottom of the pile yet. <laughs> You're not willing to shove her out of an airlock. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Number eight was Polly Wright. Number seven... Is Sarah Kingdom. Is Sarah Kingdom. Which I actually convinced Joe to swap these. Just because I was like, out of the two of them. Polly and Sarah. Out of, yeah, out of Polly and Sarah, I feel like Sarah Kingdom's character is more defined. She had like real emotional stuff, like with killing her brother. And uh, like the way she went out was tragic. Fucked up and tragic. Also, she has a badass name. She really does have a great... I think that's the only reason why she gets on these lists. It's because people want to say Sarah Kingdom. Kingdom. It sounds cool. For number six, we've got Dodo Chaplet, who entered the TARDIS randomly and then left. Unceremoniously. Unceremoniously. This is the only reason why I stick up for characters like Ben. I love Dodo Chaplet. And I I know she's like a hated companion. I know. I don't get it, though. Guys, she's delightful. She, I could maybe see her being a little annoying, maybe, but... I don't think she's If you that think annoying, about but. things wrong. <laughs> but I mean, she does She does kind of like, boop, 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 boop. That's I'm in I, trouble now. That's what I enjoy about her. She just doesn't seem to like know or care that things are happening. She's just like, oh, I'm in the past. That's cool. I don't have friends or family. Also, I'm wearing a knight's outfit. 
I just thought I just saw it, thought it looked cool. I respect her. I would like to be more like Dodo Chaplet. Things are going wrong? That's cool. <laughs> That's why she's number six on Have the list. Have you seen my sweet outfit, though? <laughs> I mean, technically, though, she's in the lower half of this ranking. Yeah, but that's only because everyone above her needs to be there. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> so let's get to number five. Susan Foreman, uh, the doctor's granddaughter. I feel like we give her, gave her a lot of shit. But even... When we were, when, yeah, when we were on her episodes. Which is not fair. Yeah. I mean, it's a little fair because it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> she definitely had some issues with her character. But, like, I feel like she was there longer, so that's why... She's She's I don't maybe... think it's just that she was there longer. I like, genuinely I don't have... like her character. I don't have, like, any negative things really to say. I mean, we have some negative things to say about Dodo. I probably have more negative things to say about Susan. But she was there longer and, like, right. I felt more connected to her than yes. Dodo. I was really mad at the way she she got kicked off the show, even though it was led to that great speech that we were talking about earlier. There is sort of a plot arc, character arc with her, even yeah. though they screw it up a bit. There's still remnants of it that work. Well, and you know, I think that's really what separates like the bottom half of the list and the top half of the list, and that did these people Being characters? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Did these characters develop? Did they have more personality than just, like, whatever blanket personality they were introduced with? Everyone at the top of the list feels like fully well-rounded characters, where everyone at the bottom of the list kind of felt like, ah, okay, this isn't working. Let's try something else. I think that's fair to say, no? That's totally fair to say. And uh, she was our first companion to go, so that was a little sad. Um, Number four, Vicky Pallister, which I think Pallister was also not from the show. I thought it was. No? Maybe. I don't know. Wasn't paying that close attention. <laughs> I know it's spelled V-I-C-K-I. Because she told you. Uh, I love Vicky. She's basically kind of like Susan 2.0. I love Vicky so much. The best time on the TARDIS ever. I mean, we'll stand by this. Like, the best TARDIS team, I think, is still that, like, small period of time where it's Ian, Barbara, Vicky, and Steven. That was so much fun, you guys. <laughs> it's literally one cereal. I, I, I think not even a full it. cereal. But it was my favorite, though. Susan didn't really feel like a granddaughter to me. as more like a rebellious teenager. Vicky felt like an actual granddaughter. I can see that. They were more cutesy, I felt like, her and the doctor. Not saying, like, well, Susan needed to be cutesy or whatever. I just, I don't know. It felt more like a grandfather their granddaughter situation with Vicky, even though they weren't related at all. Felt even more like a family when Steven came on, because then you had, they like... They were so brother and sister. They are very brother and sister, and I love that. I love Steven and Vicky as, as a TARDIS team, e- even, even though it was sad to see Barbara and Ian go, like, Steven and Vicky were great. All right, now, this is where things are going to diverge. This is where I start to disagree with Joe a little bit. Let's just say our top three. <laughs> We've no, got... No, not even our top three. I put Vicky above Steven. You put Vicky above Steven? I would put Vicky above Steven. Oh my god, get out of here. No, I get won't. Get out of town. <laughs> really? Yes, I loved Vicky. I liked Steven a whole, whole lot. But if I had, absolutely had to, I would put Vicky above Steven. So it's Steven, Vicky, Barbara, Ian. Barbara, Ian, yeah. For me, it's Vicky, Barbara, Ian, Steven. Steven at the top. Steven at the top. I love Steven. Steven Taylor is my favorite First Doctor Companion. Above you. And here's the thing to me. In my head, it's not even like Barbara, Ian. It's Ian and Barbara, Stephen and Vicky. Like their level? E- yeah. Even? Okay, well, let's, let's, let's discuss why maybe... Because we're pretty much on the same opinion about Ian and Barbara. They're sort of clumped there together. One and two for you. Two and three for me. I think Ian edges out a little bit just by being a little sillier. No, that's fair. Like, Barbara sometimes doesn't get a lot to do or is just sort of... But together... Stern. The thing they do together is great. Yeah, they're great together. Yeah, and they're the first companion, so I love them. So that's why right. they're, they're at the top. And, like, Ian's just an adorable dork and Barbara is just a badass. And Barbara Wright always right. To quote Jez. Uh, My favorite of the space babies. But like for Steven for me surpasses all of them because he reminds me a bit of Ian. I don't know. There's just something like Ian always. I've got this sort of disconnect with Ian because he feels like very 50s dad. That's why I love him. Whereas Steven feels more like me. I connect with him like on a personal level. Like I could see me playing that character. It is true. There's always like the one character on like something like Doctor Who where it's like we should go into danger and like the one guy who's like or we could not. That yeah. character is Joe. <laughs> like Steven like especially like in the gunfighters just comedic 
he was introduced with a fucking teddy bear. Oh my god! So <laughs> I love that scene so much. I just but I don't know she everything like about made such Steven. Such a big deal about that mascot, and then you never see it again. I just I just love Steven so much. All right, so that's companions. Okay. Uh, we're about to do the sweet sixteen. We're about to do the sweet sixteen. So we already went through and picked our favorite 16 cereals. Though there was much debate and argument. Right. And I know people are going to be like, why did they pick these 16? Because we We did. We are us. You can argue with us about it if you want. Um, That would be fun, actually. Let's say there's some honorable mentions. Uh, The Daleks and An Unearthly Child did not get picked. uh, Or the Space Museum. Uh, We really like the pilot of An Unearthly Child. The caveman stuff kind of sucks. Same with the Space Museum. First episode, really good. The rest of the serial kind of... Eh. And there's stuff on here that I know is, like, my personal favorite that uh, other people hate. It's Edge of Destruction. I put Edge of Destruction on the list. Fight me. I don't care. I also think... We, uh, it's an excellent series. Dalek Invasion of Earth didn't make it either, but I think it's, we picked the uh, the chase because I feel like we could only have one Dalek. One Dalek. <laughs> We've arranged these chronologically, like, first and then, like, Should we start last. at the bottom here? I don't know. Let's just start at the top. Okay. It's easier. What's is it easier? <laughs> yeah. It's it's Edge of Destruction, my pick, versus Tenth Planet. Which is my pick. Which is how <laughs> Yeah. You're saying that's easier. Well uh, okay, we should also say we have people we have, uh, on standby. We have tiebreakers on standby. We have just Jez and we have uh Chris Cherry to, to break to ties. Break ties. Alright, uh sell Edge of Destruction to me. Okay, well here's the thing. Tenth Planet is definitely the more like solidly written and uh, let's say produced mm-hmm. serial between the two. Edge of Destruction is still, for me, the most consistently entertaining. You watch The Tenth Planet, and you're like, this is great. You're a Cyberman. First Doctor's out. He has some really great moments. But there's still, like, parts of it where you're like, uh, okay, okay, uh, what's happening? Okay. There is none of that in Edge of Destruction, because the entire time you're like, what is this? Okay, but that's the what's problem happening? I have with The Edge of Destruction, is that it doesn't make a damn lick of sense. But it's gr- it's so much fun the whole time. At no point are you like, I'm bored. I'm not, maybe not bored, but I'm like, what the fuck? That doesn't make any sense. Why are they acting possessed? There's no reason for it. It doesn't make sense. And it's great. Maybe we should start at the bottom. Should we come, we'll come back to it? We'll come back to I'm it. I'm probably, you guys, I'm probably going I'm go, to I'm relax. going to text Jazz and Chris to see what they would pick. What if one of them goes one way and one of them goes the other, and then our tie's not broken? We would go I there. might relent and vote Tenth Planet. If Chris and Jazz don't have a consensus. Wait, why are you texting both of them? I thought the idea was to be to text one of them. Well, who should I text? Chris or Jazz? I don't know. Text both of them. And pick whichever one agrees with me. All right. Well, this is why I wanted to start at the bottom, because I knew this was going to be a thing. I'm going to move on to the next one to keep this stuff moving. Yeah, and I'm texting them, and we'll get back to it. Marco Polo, Gunfighters. Oh, I love both of those! I'm going to have to say Gunfighters, because it exists. Here's Okay, here's what we've got. Pros and cons it. Pros of the Gunfighters. It's a good serial. It exists. Uh, it's funny. Cons, not a lot of Team Tardis. The, the, Steven and Vicky are really good in it, and the Doctor's good in it, but I mean, they don't really get a whole lot to do plot wise. And it has that god awful fucking song. Pros and cons of Marco Polo. Pros, you've got the reveal of Genghis Khan. You've got Tagana. You've got Tagana, who I fucking love. I love Tagana. Marco Polo's pretty good too. Uh, cons, bit long, boring in places doesn't exist. I'm going to have to say Gunfighters. All right. Gunfighters moves on. Okay, Jazz has not watched Tenth Planet yet. Edge of Destruction wins by default. Wait, what, 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 let's, let's, let's. All right, all right. We'll move on to the next one. Keys of Marinus versus the Ark. Keys. God damn it. Chris hasn't actually watched the Tenth Planet. (laughs) Edge of Destruction wins by default. Wait, are we really pushing Edge of Destruction through before Tenth Planet? Yeah, let's do it. Chris and Jazz, fuck you guys. (laughs) I mean, there are fans right now who are pissed at what just happened. The Tenth Planet is like an important, historically important serial. <laughs> we just beat it out with the weird, oh, the lever was stuck episode. <laughs> just nonsense episode. <sighs> I'm fine. I'm pleased with it. All right. <laughs> Keys of Marinus and the Ark. Keys of Marinus. Yeah, it's not even a debate. It's Keys of Marinus. Keys of Marinus is probably a little more uneven. There's like... <laughs> Four different, six different episodes in that one, so. And next up we have the Aztecs and the Myth Makers. Ooh. Ooh. As much as it hurts me to say this, the Myth Makers. Yeah. Because the Aztecs is great. The Aztecs exists. It has the Doctor getting married. It has Barbara as a god. 
But the Myth Maker is just doesn't exist, but still manages to be like one of my top favorite episodes. Yeah, just so good, just well written and funny. If you're one of the people, by the way, who just doesn't watch non-existing episodes, like our previous guest Ben Padden, I would recommend watching the Myth Makers if you watch nothing else. Because you're missing out. It's so good. It's got the same quality. It's the same writer who did The Gunfighters, and it doesn't have an annoying song in it. All right. The Sensorites versus Galaxy 4. Remind me again what happens in Galaxy 4. Chumblies! Chumblies! I love the chumblies! The, the have a sort of chumbly motion. The women uh, villains and uh, the big boogery walrus. Mm, this is a hard one. Um, I'm actually would have to say Galaxy 4. I like the Sensorites, but I actually liked Galaxy 4 a lot better. Right, I'm putting down Galaxy 4 then. Reign of Terror versus the Time Meddler. That's easy for me, Time, time Meddler. Meddler. Oh, this is, I'm bummed. Because one of mine just is, is about to get bu- bumped out. Planet of Giants versus The Chase. I do like both. Planet of Giants has the tiny thing. It has a really fast pace. Oh, so I love Planet of Giants. Good set pieces. But Good set gotta pieces. gotta be The Chase. But yeah, it's probably The Chase, which has the dude from Alabama in it. It's the farewell to Ian and Barbara. And it's got the introduction of Steven, too. Yeah. I cannot say enough good things about Planet of Giants. Man, this is tougher than I thought. The Rescue versus the Romans. The Rescue versus the Romans. The Rescue, maybe? I don't know. They're both good. The Rescue was two episodes, so it was really quick. It was a good pace. I introduced Vicky. And the, the Romans has Ian sleeping with grapes, though. It does have awkward rape stuff. Mm, okay. Big for laughs. Yes, that is true. But also, it has, like, Ian and Barbara being like, we had an adventure, too, and the Doctor being like, okay. And and there's the hair ruffle scene. The rescue has that like moody ass ending, which is really <gasps> good. And like the, the 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 two people push the dude off, walk the dude off the cliff. Uh, and it has that scene where Vicky tells Barbara, Barbara that she's old. That she's old. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is a tough one. Should we send a text? Should we call for a tiebreaker? I think we should. Let's move on to the next. The rescue and the Romans is currently on a tie. <laughs> Joe, Edge of Destruction <coughs> versus Gunfighters. Two of the, like, most hated. <laughs> I'm gonna have to say Gunfighters. Really? Yeah. I'm still for Edge of Destruction. <laughs> I, really, I, I really like the Gunfighters. I'm trying the song. to push Edge of Destruction all the way through to the end. I wanted to win. All right, I'll say Gunfighters. Really? Oh, sweet. I'll, I'll let it go. Yeah, I like the Gunfighters. All right, <laughs> next up we have... Keys of Marinus and the Myth Makers. Oh, damn. Keys of Marinus has a special place in my heart because I feel like it's the, I think it was the first one we like gift. So, or gift, however you want to say it. I also it. feel like it was the moment where I was like totally sold on the show. But the Myth Makers is so damn good. The Myth Makers? Myth Makers. Guys, there's the missing cereals k- kicking ass. Kissing? Kicking? Kissing ass. Kicking All right. ass. Galaxy 4 and the Time Meddler. Oh, the Time Meddler. That's. That's easy. That's yeah. easy. And uh, before we move on... <laughs> we need an answer. For the rescue of the Romans. Uh, Jez has said Romans. I'm putting it down. I can't choose between this, though. The Chase and the Romans. Oh, I would say The Chase. The Chase? Yeah, yeah. The Chase didn't have an awkward rape scene. All right, jeez. <laughs> Gunfighters, Mythmakers, Mythmakers. That's not even... Oh, and Chris seconded the Romans. Yeah, Mythmakers, definitely. I like Gunfighters. That's not the even Gunfighters was up against the Mythmakers? Yes! That tells you that dude was a good rider. Tell you what. Or it just that, started I like off it. up against Edge of Destruction. <laughs> That's true. Well, no, it had to beat Marco Polo. You picked it over Marco Polo? Did I? We put gunfighters in over Marco Polo? Because it exists. It feels like a mistake. All right, well, we're second we did it. guessing ourselves. We yeah. did it. We can't go back. All right, Time Meddler or The Chase? I'm going to have to say Time Meddler. Really? I like The Chase. Oh, well, damn. I just I don't know. Okay, because the chase was good, but it also had some, like, conquer stuff in it. It was definitely, like, a very choppy thing. It did have the House of Horrors thing. And... He loved that. <sighs> We're in the human mind. I don't know. I'm trying to, I can remember stuff much more vividly about the chase than I can about the time meddler. Oh, but I love the time meddler, though. I'll give it to the chase, though. The chase was a little more solid. All right. The Chase. That leaves us with The Chase and Myth Makers. The Chase and Myth Makers. I don't know. The final cereal of Ian and Barbara or the just really good missing cereal. And we can't, we actually can't call in for a tiebreaker? Jez has seen it. Jez has seen it. Chris Cherry has 
probably not seen the Myth Makers. Let's let's ask Jez her opinion. Do you want to call her so we can reason it out with her? Sure. Hello. Welcome to the podcast, Jez. <laughs> You're welcome. All right, we are at the end of this. We have come to the Myth Makers and the Chase. For which one's better? Yeah, yes. this is our the final two. It's the Myth Makers for sure. <laughs> That's my favorite overall. Yeah, I am. I think so. Tempted to agree. All right, I'm circling it. I'm circling it, you guys. The Myth Makers won. A completely missing cereal has won as our favorite cereal of all of the First Doctor era. I didn't call. It's the most it is. It's so it's well so written. It's so much fun. I tried... It's, like the, it's the best historical. Like, it's an actual historical, but it also plays on, you know, things that you know about history, and it twists them a little bit the way you want them to, but it also has really good lines. Yes, it has some of the best lines. I tried really hard to get Edge of Destruction till the end, uh, but Joe wasn't having it. The gunfighters yeah. beat it out, which... Mm. The gun- it beat out the Tenth Planet, though, and I'm starting to feel guilty about it, to be honest. I'm starting to feel guilty that it beat out the Tenth Planet, which was technically a better episode. Well, I, I think it's, a, it's, I think it's amazing that uh, the Gunfighters was up against the Myth Makers, because those two episodes are written by the same dude. You can tell they're both really nicely written. I mean, Gunfighters mm-hmm. has the terrible song, but that's really all that's bad about it, is that terrible song. I'll tell you, when I was driving home yesterday, I was thinking about that whoa, whoa, whoa line. <laughs> <laughs> I love that line. Can we vote that line as the top line of the one era of Doctor Who? Yes. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, too, it's too late to, to say, say woe to the, the horse. horse. <laughs> That's it. That's why it won. It's that line. <laughs> it was the one that started uh, the subtitles for the podcast episodes, wasn't it? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Woe to the horse. Jez, yes. I'm going to read you what we have and you can tell me your thoughts, all right? Yeah, let's see what okay. you would pick. Yeah, yeah. Here, are, Here's what we started with. Edge of Destruction. Edge of Destruction, 10th Planet. Well, she already said Edge of Destruction. Edge of Destruction, 10th Planet. Vote on that. Marco Polo Gunfighters. Marco Polo. See, I feel like we've done wrong. <laughs> I feel like it should have been Marco Polo. I really like Gunfighters. I like Marco Polo, too. I'm I mean, to Ghana. I know. He went up against Gunfighters, and he was so uncertain. <laughs> I just love Steven Regret Taylor. Okay. And, I don't know. Keys of Marinus, The Ark. Keys of Marinus. That one isn't even a question. Uh, the Aztecs, the Myth Makers. I wonder Myth what makers. she's going to pick. All right, she's going to pick the Myth Makers. The Sensorites, Galaxy 4. Oh, it takes me a minute to remember which ones are which. Um, Sensorites, I think. Galaxy, and that's the thing. Okay, Galaxy 4 is the one... Okay, here's why I think the problem is with Galaxy 4 is it's just a generic sounding title and people forget what it is, but it's the Chumblies one, which... Oh, that's true. I really like the Chumblies. I love the Chumblies. And the villain in that was... Pretty I wish we could bring back scary. the Chumblies. Chumblies. That's you Peter Capaldi's favorite. Categories like best alien or best robot. Ooh. So yeah. that you can vote different things into categories like that. What would you say the best the best alien of the one era is? I really like the design of like. I really like the design of like the monoids. The monoids, the chumblies. Mm-hmm. I guess like the Daleks have to be up there. The Cybermen have to be yeah. up there because you know they're yeah. still around. What are the brain jars from the Keys of Marinus called? The <laughs> brains in a jar, glass jar. <laughs> they're they're up there. Mostly, I remember those because of the gift of Barbara destroying them. The yes. war machines were pretty cool. What about the what are they the boards? Oh. They're just uh, they're not at the top of the list, you guys. Oh, the, what about the uh, the 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 the, the, mono, the Monoptera? I the loved. Zarby. I loved the Optera. The little pill bugs, the little grumpy pill yes. bugs. All they did was hop around, and they were so cute. But they talked like this, and they were grumpy. I loved them. Okay, so guys, when we were coming up with this list, I actually ranked all of the serials. Surprisingly, the Web Planet was not at the bottom. His list is terrible, though. It's not terrible. It is terrible. You just say that because the Edge of Destruction was so low. Well, but I like, know I'm alone in this. Web I Planet know I'm wasn't... the only one weird person who loves Edge of Destruction. I well, don't care. The Web Planet wasn't even the second lowest. What was the lowest? Uh, the Smugglers. You keep saying that, and I keep being like... What was the Smugglers? Yeah. We just watched it. <laughs> yes! And that's why it's the lowest one on the list, because it's so bad. The bottom was the smugglers, then Mission to the Unknown, Mission to the and Unknown. then um, to be there. then the Web Planet. What were your top? Uh, Some of your top Myth Makers was top. See, it deserves to win. I agree. I don't remember what else was up there. There you go. <laughs> Myth Makers 
The best episode? Best serial. Best serial. The first doctor. The first doctor. The best companion, Stephen Taylor. And, Wrong. Uh, best Ian companion Chester. is Ian Chesterton. Well, mm-hmm. agree to disagree there. Agree Stephen to be, Taylor for me. For you to be wrong. All right, who's your uh, your favorite, like, side character that's not, that's not like, a um, okay. Um, Tagana for me. Vicky's pet. Vicky's pet. Vicky's dog. <laughs> I really like Doc Holliday. Oh, Doc Holliday was great. And, um... But, Paris. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but, um, um... Paris was great. Steven. The character Steven plays before he's Steven. <gasps> oh. <laughs> I should know, because I just posted that thing about... He's the he's the first person to call the TARDIS blue. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's like Milton or something like that? No, that's not right. The yokel from Alabama. Should we let Jez go? <laughs> <laughs> Since we really just called her to, to help us get to Midnight's, we didn't tell her we were going to do that, you guys. I hope this even picks up on the microphone. But yeah, thanks for being a surprise guest. You're welcome. I'm glad I was home. <laughs> I feel like we could have come to the Myth Makers. On our own. But we just wanted to just, just say hi to Jazz. Yeah, we did. Morton. It's Morton Dill. That was his name. I knew it was like a... An M? Mm, yeah, with a T. I, it's with Morton and Milton. With a T. Morton and Milton aren't that different. But yeah, Morton Dill. And if you guys that didn't see on uh, on our Tumblr, I was suddenly struck by this thought that the show's black and white. It's not exactly 100% a thing that it's blue. Although almost everyone who we know who's like actually from the UK is like, well, it's a police box. So that's how they know that it's blue. Well, I mean, I talked to Ben Patton. He said there are red and red ones, and I think there's green ones as well. He's like, I mean, they're not as common and stuff. But he's like, it's most likely blue. But, I mean, it's it, true that it might not be. And it's not until the chase that it's very specifically said to be blue. There you go. There you go. All right. Thank you, Jets. <laughs> You're welcome. Well, we'll see you whenever your next episode is. <laughs> well, we'll talk to you before then. Yeah, we'll talk before that. <laughs> Bye. We're waving at the phone. Bye. That was special surprise guest Jess. Just Jess. Let's let's talk a little bit about fun. the first we doctor. We should do that more often. We should. As you guys know, I've already watched all of this. This is my second time through it. Forgotten a lot of it because I watched it like when I was a bit younger. It I watched it spread out over the course of like a few years. I think since I was like fifteen or sixteen, possibly. Uh, and I only got up to like a couple episodes into two. Or a couple serials into two. So I knew going in that I was going to at least like it. Though I feel like I like it more this go around. And like William Hartnell is and will always be my doctor. So. That's the cutest thing. So, but I'm interested about you, Tony. Because yeah. you hadn't seen, I don't think you'd seen any of the first doctor. No. And I know there was like some question of whether or not you'd enjoy it once we started. And. The slower pace and all that. So, tell me your thoughts of, of what it's been like for, like, this past year and a half. Is that how long it's been? No, it's not been a year and a half. It's been, like, a year and a couple months. My God. I not even a year and a couple months. Like a year. exponentially more than I thought I would. <laughs> and, I mean, that was kind of, like, yeah, I mean, like, I knew what I was getting into as far as the pace. What I was worried about is that we would, like, we're going to do this, we're going to, you know, make a podcast, and then I'm going to be stuck watching a show that I don't really care for. Um, but that's the thing of it, though, is that it's very clearly still Doctor Who. And I understand now what you mean when you're like, William Hartnell is my doctor. Because that's, it used to be that... I, I started watching with Nine, but I started watching when I think Ten was really popular, and then I went back to Nine. Like, Ten was my idea of who the Doctor was. And then, you know, Eleven came along, and he was great, and I loved him. But, like, a there was, you know, there's, like, a while there where you're still, like, I'm loving stories with, like, Eleven, but, like, when I think of the Doctor, I think of Ten. And that's, like, genuinely not the case anymore. Like, when I think of the Doctor, I either think of all of them or one. <laughs> <laughs> and when, when I say all of them, I mean all of them I've seen so far. So one, nine, ten, and eleven. Because, and five. For some reason, there was, like, some point where I was, like, I'm gonna watch all of the Doctor's deaths... That's weird. <laughs> I'm weird. And then you just kept watching. I wanted to see all the regenerations because I thought that would be cool. And there was a time where I had like how each of them died memorized. I'm weird. I don't have a good explanation <laughs> for why I did this. But yeah, I, I just watched a bunch of five. Like five for a long time. Five was like the only classic that I'd seen and I because li- I liked him. I liked him a lot. I don't know. I love one as a character. I can't imagine, like, not knowing Ian and Barbara. I love them so much. (laughs) You were, like, in love with them by, like, episode two. I I was, yeah. You seemed shocked. I was. I was worried that you weren't going to care for it. Oh, you know what I was going to say, though, is we need... What we should have done 
and I forgot about it, was go back and listen to the first episode of the podcast. Because I know there's like a, 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 a bit of me saying like, I know you really, like you've watched this all before and you know and like you really like Ian. I think Ian is an idiot and I don't <laughs> know about him right now. <laughs> and I know, I know we have a clip of me saying that. Past me so stupid. <laughs> You're not wrong. He's a bit of an idiot. I mean, he's he, an adorable he, idiot. But that's why I love him. So yeah, it, I I think we should probably pull some of those and and listen to them. Maybe come back and add how wrong we were or how right we were. That's what we should do at the end of the <laughs> of, of of the eighth Doctor. <laughs> at the end of the eighth Doctor. Yeah, I do want to say I feel like William Hartnell established who the Doctor is, and I'm excited to get to Patrick Troughton. Who I feel established what the doctor can be. Oh, nice. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> you were watching an adventure in space and time and, and seeing Hartnell kind of the one at a grumpy old man and Hartnell being you know, being like, he needs to be kind. He needs to have the sparkle or whatever it was they called it in the movie. And I feel like that's something that's like at kind of the core of his character. So it's nice that he established that. Yeah, because he could have just been a complete grump. Um, can't wait to see what's coming up next. Speaking of, we'll be back next time for uh, the first serial of, of the second Doctor, The Power of the Daleks. We will have special guest Vincent E.L. on that episode, which is going to be fun because he did not take any notes. And he's planning on just... Just free-balling it. Winging it like the rest of us. If you like our stuff, uh, feel free to check us out at WatchYourAssalon.com. Our Twitter is WatchYourAss. Two R's for WatchYourAss. One R for WatchYourAssalon.com. Yeah, we didn't think that went through, you guys. So Twitter, Twitter is Twitter. Twitter's Twitter. Twitter's Twitter is at Twitter. Our Twitter is at WatchYourAss with two R's. And our website is Watch Your Ass Along with one R. Uh, if you like us and want to help us out, you can go to... I mean, to... it's two R's altogether. Because there's an R in your. No, it's Watch You Rassle On. Oh, is it? Yeah. That's confusing, Joe. I know. <laughs> we, we should just be WatchYourRass.com. I thought we were. We're not. We're Watch You Rassle On.com. That's very confusing. We need to buy a new domain All name. All right. <laughs> we'll get on that, you guys. If you like us and want to support us, um, you can go to WatchYourRassleOn.com slash support. How many R's are in that? Fuck you. W A T C H Y O U R A S S I L O N dot com slash S U P P O R T. Um, there you can find our Patreon, which is patreon.com slash watchathon, where you can donate a per month amount and get special cool things like behind the scenes stuff, watch alongs and video recordings of the podcast, unedited video recordings of the podcast, stuff like that. And there's also a link to our Amazon wish list where you can become a sponsor uh, of an episode and we will like if you purchase one of the DVDs, you will become a sponsor for that episode and we will shout you out on that episode. We'll put you on our friends of Rassilon page and uh, stuff like that. And again, we'll be back next time for the Power of the Daleks. We just finished the first doctor and I got to tell you it's far from all over. Thank you guys to anyone who has been with us from the beginning or anyone who's new and is just checking us out. We appreciate you guys. Thanks for sticking around. You're the best. You guys are our favorites. We do it for you guys. And also we want to watch Doctor Who. Bye! Bye! C.S. Lewis meets H.G. Wells meets Father Christmas. That's the Doctor.